we're going to talk about the anatomy of unsigned integer division. To do this, we need to start with two numbers. We'll call those capital N and capital D. We'll say that those two numbers are in the set of unsigned integers. Another way to say that is that both N and D are non-negative integer values or non-negative whole numbers. They're the counting numbers starting at 0, 1, 2, 3, going all the way off to infinity. We're going to set those values to be some constants. In order to do the division problem involving capital N and capital D, we're going to make the assumption that D is a non-zero value. Then we're going to consider the anatomy of a division problem in two separate ways. One of those is going to be using the division symbol. That is a binary operator. The operand on the left-hand side, we're going to call capital N. The operator on the right-hand side, we're going to call capital D. The left operand is known as the dividend in this particular operation. And the right operand is known as the divisor. If we wanted to express this problem using the fraction bar, we would put the left operand on top of the bar and the right operand on the bottom. In that situation, we would call the thing on top the numerator and the thing on bottom the denominator. In other words, dividends are the same things as numerators. Divisors are the same thing as denominators. Let's take a look at an example of how this plays out. We're going to choose two non-negative integers or unsigned integers. We'll choose one dividend, aka numerator, that will be 25 in this situation. And then for the divisor, another way to say that is denominator, we'll choose the number 2. We know from our previous life in mathematics that 25 divided by 2 is the same thing as 25 over 2. We can write that in decimal notation as 12.5. Mathematicians take that a little bit further and actually write it as a mixed number. Part of that number will be an integer, which is the number 12. And the other part of that number will be the remaining piece of 25 that is not an integer value of 2. Another way to say that is the remainder divided by the denominator. So this is 12 and 1 half. Some folks like to actually rewrite this in what we call remainder notation. In the remainder notation, we see that the 25 divided by 2 actually has two separate components. One of those is called an integer quotient, and the other is called an integer remainder. So we write 12 r 1. In other words, 25 divided by 2 produces the integer quotient 12. There are 12 full groups of 2 in 25, but then there's a remainder of 1, which is the thing that's left over. We can say that in English as 25 is not an even number. This leads to a more general statement. Anytime we have a unsigned integer n divided by some unsigned non-zero integer d, we can always write that as q r lowercase r, where this is integer quotient q remainder lowercase r. These constructions, when we say n divided by d is equal to q remainder r, or another way to say this is when I divide a numerator by a denominator, I can write that as a pair of two integers. One of those is the integer quotient, the other is the remainder. The integer quotient is really special because it's the largest multiple of the denominator d that is still less than the numerator n. Another way to say that is if I looked at the ratio n divided by d, the integer quotient will always be less than that ratio. And because this is an integer, we know q plus 1 is also an integer, and the fraction n divided by d will always be between q and q plus 1. But remember, we're claiming that n divided by d can be written as q remainder r. In mathematical notation, that means q plus r divided by d, where lowercase r is what we call our integer remainder. And we're claiming that lowercase r has to be bounded above and never equal to capital D, or else we would increment q. Another way to say that is that the integer quotient will always be less than or equal to the actual value of the fraction, and that will be bounded above by 1 plus the integer quotient. This inequality right here gives us kind of some interesting ways to think about what the integer quotient is. And we're going to claim that the integer quotient is going to be the floor function of n divided by d, and that the remainder must be between 0, could be equal to 0, if n divided by d produces a quotient by itself. But if it does have a remainder, that remainder will be bounded above by d and never equal to d itself. 
Let's take a look at this equality right here where we're using the floor function to quantify the integer quotient. This floor function is kind of a unique function in math. It shows up in some strange places and is not often part of standard curriculum. We're gonna go ahead and explore that. In MATLAB, there's actually a function called floor. And if we typed help floor, we would see that the floor function rounds towards minus infinity. Another way to say this is if I have a decimal expansion of a number, the floor function will always round to the highest integer lower than that number. Let's take a look at what I mean here. We're going to create a vector x, and we're going to say that vector runs from, let's say, negative 10, goes up by increment value of 0 0.1, and goes up to positive 10. If I were to actually plot x and x together, what we would see is a line, of course, with slope 1. Claim I'm going to make here, though, is if I take y equal to the floor of x and then suppress the output, because that's a kind of a large vector, now what I can do is actually click on x, hold shift, click on y, and let's go over to plots. And then what we're going to do is do a scatter plot. Do you see that one? The one that says scatter? If I push enter here, notice what we see is a plot of the function floor of x for all inputs along this area. The reason that I did a scatter plot rather than a regular plot, if I go back to here, highlight those two, and then hit plot, MATLAB in the plot does something called interpolation. Kids call that connect the dots. So what MATLAB is doing is taking each point in X and then just drawing a line between them. And we get these like vertical lines, which actually is not part of the floor function. The floor function does not have a connection between each step on this curve. And that's why I much prefer the scatter plot version. So if I just go up twice and go to scatter, we get this plot out. Let's analyze this plot to think about what the behavior of the floor function is. Notice what we're saying is that at negative 10, the floor function value is negative 10. But if I go up to negative 9.5, the floor function is gonna send that down towards infinity. Well, what's the closest integer to negative 9.5 but less than negative 9.5? It must be 10. And that's true for every point along that line. If I go, I don't know, negative 9.1. Negative 9.1 is not an integer. What happens when we round towards infinity? Well, that's gonna drop down to negative 10. Then all of a sudden at negative nine, what's the floor of negative nine? Well, negative nine is an integer. So we say floor of negative nine is negative nine. But all fractional pieces that are slightly bigger than negative nine, but less than negative eight, those are all gonna get rounded down to negative nine, which is why we see this kind of stair-step structure. In other words, the floor function literally takes any input and sends it down to the closest integer that is less than that value. And that is why we get this really, really interesting stair-step structure in the graph of the floor function. But notice that's exactly what we do when we're trying to take the division problem n divided by d and find our integer quotient. We're trying to find the largest multiple of d that is still less than n. Or another way to say that is we're taking the floor function of n divided by d. Let's analyze all this terminology using MATLAB for our first example where n is 25 and d is 2. We're going to repeat this pretty often, so I'm actually going to create a script file. Before I do anything, I'm going to save that script file and I'm going to call it my favorite title, which is integer quotient sandbox. I'm playing in a sandbox, not building a structure right now because I'm just literally exploring. I'll save that in the desktop. And then in this case, I'm going to set n to be equal to 25, I believe, and d to be equal to 2. Let's go ahead and run that and make sure we got it. So n is 25, d is 2. Great, I have it. So now what we're going to do is to find the integer quotient q, and we just said that that's going to be the floor of n divided by d. Let's go ahead and test that. So when we look at the integer quotient q, that is indeed 12. And if we were to look at all multiples of denominator d between 0 and 25, the 12th multiple is going to be the largest integer below 25 that is in that list. And I can see that if I go 2 up by 2s all the way to 26, let's or 25, let's say, the largest value, which is the 12th entry of that column, is going to be 24. And that's exactly what it says when I say q is equal to the floor of n divided by d. Another way to say that is 2 times 12 is the largest integer that is still less than 25. When we're trying to find the remainder, we can use this remainder function. So I can set r equal to the remainder of n and d. Notice when I run that code, 
I indeed see that R in this case is one and Q is 12. Now that we have those in memory, check this out. If I take Q times D plus R, notice I'm always gonna get N. Or another way to say that is, if I ask the question, is it true that Q times D plus R is equal to N, MATLAB returns logical one. In other words, this is a true statement. We can run other checks here. Let's go ahead and test, is Q less than or equal to N divided by D? That is true. Is N divided by D strictly less than Q plus one, that is true. And then if I wanted to test both conditions at the same time, I would just say, is it true that Q is less than or equal to N divided by D? And is it also true that N divided by D is strictly less than Q plus one? Those two are true at the same time. And indeed, MATLAB is reporting that with my logical one command. The last claim that we made is that zero will always be less than or equal to our remainder R, which will be less than D. If I had to write that in logical test, I could see zero less than or equal to R and R strictly less than D. Is that true? MATLAB reports, yes, it's true it must be true by the construction of what we're looking at in integer division. Now that we've just performed all three of those checks, let's capture that in a MATLAB structure. So we're gonna call this check, and we're gonna store this in a one by three logical vector. The first check that we saw was actually checking whether or not the value of n was equal to q times d plus r. We're gonna go ahead and store that in the first entry of that vector. The second check was to see whether or not the integer quotient bounds n divided by d below, which would mean that q plus one is a strictly upper bound to that. Notice that's an and operator there. And then the third check that we were gonna do was to confirm that remainders have to be between zero and d, could be equal to zero, but never will be equal to z. When we run that code, notice that we get a logical one, one, one. That's equivalent to saying all three of those conditions will always be true, which is exactly what we expected from the math that we use to generate those inequalities. What's really nice about this now is that when we look at a different example, suppose that we say that the numerator is 19 and the denominator is five, we actually have some code that we can just simply take 19 and five, and now this is a general structure. When we run that again, notice 19 divided by five is 3.8. We can write that in mixed number notation as three and four divided by five, or three and four fifths, which in remainder notation is three remainder four. So our integer quotient Q is given as three, our remainder value is given as four. In other words, the largest multiple of five that's less than 19 happens when we multiply five by three, AKA 15. When we do that, we expect four units left over. That's a really fancy way to say 15 plus four is 19. But remember, we had closed form formulas to express that. So in this case, we said that Q was gonna be the floor of N divided by D. We expect that to be three. We said that R was going to be the remainder when we take N divided by D, and we expect that to be four. And then we also ran the check on N, Q, and and r, which was captured in our check variable, that vector should have all logical ones if those checks are true, and that's exactly what we see. The last thing that I'll note here is this remainder function, we could have equivalently used the mod function. So check this out. If I take the remainder between n divided by d, and I check, is that the same or different from mod n divided by d, these are identical in almost all situations. I leave it to a challenge to you to figure out when mod is different from remainder. You can use the .matlab documentation to answer that question for yourself. That leads to our last example of this notation, 64 divided by 16. In this case, we're saying that the dividend is 64 and the divisor is 16. When I run this, notice 64 divided by 16 is 4.0. Another way to say that is that it's four and zero sixteenths. The moment I see that remainder is zero, I know that 64 actually is an integer multiple of 16. There's nothing left over. In remainder notation, we would say four R zero. In other words, there are exactly four groups of 16 and 64, and there's nothing left over in that calculation. Here we call four the integer coefficient and zero the integer remainder. When we ran this code, we already saw that our conditions n equal q times d plus r, 
That is true because it's the first entry of our logical vector. We also say that Q bounds below N divided by D and it's bounded above by Q plus one and that R is between zero and D could be equal to zero but never equal to D. In this case, we actually have a zero value because the numerator was a multiple of the denominator. In other words, the integer quotient was the entire output for that division problem. Let's do a quick recap of what we've just learned. When we take the dividend divided by the divisor, that's the same thing as a numerator divided by a denominator. And when we're working in the space of integers, we're gonna say that we can partition that into a group of two integers. One of those is gonna be called an integer coefficient Q. And the other one is gonna be called an integer remainder lowercase r. And we can write that in remainder notation as Q uppercase r lowercase r. We could also read that as Q remainder r. Each of these integers, Q and r, have some special properties. Q we call the integer quotient, and it was the largest multiple of the denominator D that was still less than or equal to the numerator n. In MATLAB, we calculate that using the floor function of n divided by d. On the other hand, the lowercase r we call the integer remainder. In MATLAB, we calculated that using the remainder function, which is rem, and then we said n comma d. That's what's left over when we calculate n minus q times d. So if there is a difference between q times d and n, R actually quantifies that difference exactly. Notice that it must be strictly less than D. It will never be equal to D because if it was the case that R was equal to D, Q would just increment by one. That's the point of Q. It's the largest integer multiple of D that is less than or equal to N. All this gives us some fancy notation and words to talk about what integer division consists of. So when I take n divided by d and I say that that's q remainder lowercase r, we write that as a mixed number as q and then r over d, and we write that in math notation as q plus r over d. But if I were to multiply this entire sequence of equations by d, notice I would produce the exact equality that we've tested in previous parts of this video. n divided by d times d is just n. Q plus R over D, well, that's Q times D plus R because D cancels out with D. So this integer division problem where we write it like this is just another way to express this equation. In words, that means that the largest multiple of D that is less than or equal to N is Q and R is what's left over. Or another way to say that is if I subtracted R from N, I would get a pure multiple of D on the outside and the number that I would need to multiply by D is Q. Now that we have this notation, we can use it to actually categorize every non-negative integer as either even or odd. Specifically, let's say that we had an unsigned integer n, which is non-negative whole number, and then that our denominator or divisor is two. So we have n divided by d becomes n divided by two, and we're saying that no matter what n we choose, we can always write that as q remainder lowercase r, where lowercase r is what we call our remainder. Remember, r has to be greater than or equal to zero and strictly less than divisor d, which is two. Well, what are the integers that are greater than or equal to zero and less than two? Well, it must be zero or one. This is exactly what we say. Every number that is a non-negative integer is either even, that's the case where our remainder is zero, or odd, that's the case that our remainder is one. In other words, every unsigned integer can be written in the form a multiple of two plus a remainder, and that remainder is either zero or one. But that is exactly the statement that a number is either even or odd. Even numbers have the property that that remainder is zero. In other words, when we look at an unsigned integer that's even, it must be two times some integer quotient plus r, where r is zero. In other words, we can write all even numbers as two times q, where q is n divided by two. On the other hand, odd numbers have the property that that remainder r is one. So we say that n is gonna be two times q plus r, or two times q plus one. Another way to say that is that if I look at n minus one, that becomes an even number. These two expressions for even and odd numbers are super useful in computer programming, and they are also really, really helpful Helpful for trying to construct binary representations of unsigned integers, which is a major theme in this class. That leads me to the community challenge for this video, which is to construct the equivalent 
categorization of all unsigned integers not using the denominator two, but instead using the denominator three. How many different categories of numbers would we have if we thought about breaking this with denominator three? The moment that you have that, an extension to our community challenge is, how is this related to modular arithmetic? Can you describe how these particular observations that we're making relate to the concept of the mod function in MATLAB. You can write your responses to that community challenge in the comment section below. Of course, I welcome your feedback, comments, questions, and concerns. Always, when you give me feedback, I grow as a content creator. Thank you so much for your attention, and I'll see you in the next video.